Okay, lesson three of your A-level history, Democracy in Crisis from 1919 to 1923. Let's move on with the major questions. So the major questions, again, make notes on these so you feel you should be able to answer these and give some evidence. Why did right and left-wing extremists hate the Weimar Republic so much? So opposition to the Weimar Republic from both the extreme left and the extreme right. Why were the extreme right able to make a political comeback in the early 1920s? Remember, really, it's the extreme right um, it's, it's under a dictatorship, really, essentially, of Ludendorff and Hindenburg and the Kaiser, that the war is prosecuted and they lose the war. Yet, despite that loss of prestige, the loss of the war, they're able to make a political comeback in the early 1920s. Why was 1923 in particular a year of crisis for Germany? And why did democracy in Germany survive the threats it faced from the left and right in the early 1920s? Well, let's begin by looking at the threat from the right. Well, who were the extreme right? They were Junkers. Remember, that's the aristocratic elite of uh, Germany, derived mainly from uh, Prussia, uh, Eastern Prussia, aristocratic landowners, uh, senior army officers and industrial tycoons. The party of the extreme right was the German Nationalist People's Party. And nationalist is a word which you really do associate with the extreme right, they, as opposed to internationalist. The, the left wing tended to be internationalist, believe in cooperation between nations. The right wing are nationalist. They see uh, the world as a struggle between nations and they have to fight for Germany against other nations. They see it as a win-lose game. So the German Nationalist People's Party, the DNVP, is the party of the extreme right. As I said, they are a big, big support, a base of support for them was in northern Germany and eastern Germany, in, in eastern Prussia. Um, monarchists, they were supporters of the Kaiser. They were anti-democratic. They saw it as letting in the corrupting influences of socialism. Uh, and they were anti-Semitic. They saw it as... Uh, a, as, as a Jewish uh, thing, and they were anti-Semitic, and they were anti-anti-socialist as well. Uh, the DNVP got a, you generally got in Weimar elections around about 10% of the national vote. Well, let's look at this guy, a very, very significant figure in the DNV and the extreme right. This is Alfred Hugenberg. He was a very, very wealthy uh, industrial tycoon. He was a, a media tycoon. Now, Alfred Hugenberg and other, obviously, if you look at the support base, army officers, industrial tycoons, there's a lot of cash support from these wealthy individuals for the DNVP and for the extreme right. Let's look in a little bit more detail at Alfred Hugenberg and explore why he was such a, an influential figure. Well, he owned uh, film studios, he owned uh, a large amount of newspapers. So, again, a big form of, of opinion. Although, if you do remember, each of the sectional groups, the Socialists, the Catholics, and so on, they did sort of read their own newspapers, which helped to reinforce their, their separate sectional views. Uh, another significant um, group associated with the extreme right and the DNVP were the Stahlhelm. Stahlhelm is, is German for steel helmets. These were an ex-servicemen's group, similar to the Free Corps, um, and they were, although they were supposed to be independent, an independent uh, ex-servicemen's association. They were heavily associated with the DNVP. Um, they were essentially almost its paramilitary wing. For example, they guarded uh, meetings and demonstrations organized by the DNVP. Well, why did these guys hate the Weimar Republic so much? Well, first reason is that the Weimar Republic essentially represents a loss of power for the extreme right, which really had a monopoly on power in, you know, Second Reich Germany from 1871. Um, they see it as opening the door to Catholics and Jews, which uh, tend to be despised by members of the extreme right. Uh, again, it, part of really related to that, uh, they call uh, the, the Weimar Republic a Sotsi Republic, a Socialist Republic, and a Juden Republic, a Jewish Republic. Definitely, the extreme right in Germany are characterized by extreme anti-Semitism. They uh, believe uh, really ridiculous conspiracy theories about uh, Jewish people, uh, and they see uh, the Jewish influence on, on German life, as they see it, as, as corrosive. Uh, number three, reason number three, they see the German government, the Weimar government, as the November criminals who have stabbed the German army in the back 
by accepting the November, you know, the armistice of November. This is the so-called Dolchtos myth, and it is a myth because Ludendorff and Hindenburg absolutely saw with stark clarity that the war was lost. There was no way they could have won the war. Their, their allies in Austria-Hungary had collapsed. You know, there were fresh German. The, the war was lost, but they managed to hand the shame of that defeat on to the, the government which signed it in November. So lots of people believe this myth that the government were November criminals, uh, that socialists and Jews uh, associated with the Weimar Republic had stabbed the German army in the back, the so-called Dolchtos myth. Again, Hugenberg is a right-wing media tycoon. His newspapers make a lot of play of things such as the so-called Barmat scandal, where senior members, civil servants in the Weimar Republic are supposed to have uh, cheated the government in, in some sort of corrupt scandal with uh, a Jewish businessman. Uh, again, myth-making, uh, racist myth-making in, in progress from the extreme right there. Let's have a look now at the Treaty of Versailles and see how that actually spawned uh, immense resentment in Germany on the right and indeed the left and th throughout German society in general. The Allied leaders were arguing their way over the whole future of the German people. <laughs> I love this guy's really plummy uh, RP accent, so let's hear a bit more. The extreme uh, resentment in Germany caused by the Versailles settlement. I'll, I'll, put, I'll play this video for you. Under their hands, the map of Europe was drawn and redrawn again. At last, after more than three months of discussion, they presented the terms of their treaty to the Germans. Germany lost land in the east, the west, and the north. In the east, the most important of those losses was the wide strip of territory given to the newly independent Poland, separating East Prussia from the rest of Germany. While on the west, France took back the provinces of Alsace and Lorraine, and was also given the right to mine coal in the Saar, an area placed under League of Nations control for 15 years. To protect France, Germany was forbidden to station soldiers in the Rhineland, an area which was to be occupied by Allied troops until 1935. It was not only the loss of territory which Germany resented, but also the fact that Czechoslovakia and Poland now contained large numbers of Germans. And as if to add insult to injury, the treaty forbade German-speaking Austria to unite with Germany. Her fortifications were to be destroyed. Her army was to be reduced to 100,000 men. No air force, no submarines, and to accept blame for starting the war and pay reparations. In protest at Scarpa Flo, the British naval base, the Germans scuttled their fleet rather than hand it over to the Allies. It was a last defiant gesture. Germany would have to agree to the terms. She was in no position to restart the war. Okay, that's enough there. So, if we have a little look in some more... Oops, crikey, sorry about that. If we have a little look at some more detail then, at uh, aspects of that, if we could really highlight three major aspects of the Versailles Settlement which caused widespread anger throughout Germany. First was the so-called diktat, the fact that um, the German representatives of Versailles, there was no negotiation, they were simply told the terms of the treaty. The war guilt clause caused a special um, horror and disgust and outrage in Germany as they felt that they were not the only guilty members in starting the First World War. It was however necessary for the Allies if they were going to get reparations. The Polish Corridor and other areas of Germany, this uh, a huge amount of resentment split Germany in two and uh, as the video said it, you know, it cut some Germans off. So huge resentment in Germany from both the right wing and indeed the left wing across this political spectrum to the Treaty of Versailles. Let's have a look now at the Cap Putsch of 1920. This is a right-wing attempt to seize power within Germany. It's essentially triggered by the Versailles Settlement, which causes the, the complete dismemberment of the German army down to 100,000 men. Well, Gustav Nosk, the defence minister, if you remember before, he'd made use of the Free Corps to put down the Spartacists in the so-called Spartacist Week. Well, now he obeys the terms of the Treaty of Versailles and disbands the German army, which includes, um, includes essentially the, the Free Corps as well. They're ordered to, to disband and, and to, to hand over their weapons. Well, the Erhardt Brigade under uh, Hermann Erhardt, they, they, they totally uh, resent this. They resent the fact they've been told to disband after 
so apparently saving the Republic. And together, Hermann Erhardt, the, the leader of one of these free corps, the, the, the free corps, the uh, Erhardt Brigade, together with General Walter von Lutwitz and a right-wing politician, Wolfgang Kapp, they attempt to seize power. They take over the, uh, the buildings in Berlin and attempt to seize power. Now then, the moderate socialists under Ebert, they turn to the army general, Hans von Siegt, and ask the, 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 the general, in the, uh, Hans von Siegt, to help put down the Kapp Putsch. Well, this is, this is his response. Troops do not fire on troops. So the army, the, the, the remainder of the army, refused to help the moderate socialists to put down the Kapp Putsch. Well, why then does it fail? Three principal reasons. First of all, it's pretty poorly organised. They, they haven't made sure they've got widespread support. Uh, Berlin's civil servants refused to work for the Kapp Putsch leaders. Uh, and, and a government is comprised both of elected members of parliament and unelected civil servants who basically carry out the instructions. They carry out they're the machinery of government. And if the civil servants refuse to work with you, you, you cannot run an effective government. Um, and the Social Democrats also organise a general strike which paralyzes Berlin and brings it to a halt. The, the, the cat putsch, they, they realize it's um, impossible and the cat putsch fails. Um, Hermann Erhardt, though, uh, is, is, it's not over uh, for him, by, but a pretty long shot. He goes on to form uh, a right wing, essentially a terrorist group called the Organization Consul. Uh, so Hermann Erhardt, again, he, this is basically a, a group focused on political assassinations. They're assassinating what they see as enemies of Germany from their extreme right-wing point of view. Just to give you a couple of examples, Matthias Erzberger of the Catholic Centre Party, he was assassinated because he was uh, one of the guys that signed the armistice back in November of 1918. Uh, so he's one of the November criminals. Walter Rattenau was uh, assassinated in 1922. Again, remember these groups are anti-Semitic. He's assassinated principally because he's Jewish. This, however, does cause an outbreak of popular protest, and the Organisation Council is disbanded uh, after the assassination of Rathenau. Let's move on and look at the crisis of 1923, specifically the hyperinflation crisis. Let's begin with that. So, hyperinflation. The Treaty of Versailles, obviously, um, came out in, in uh, 1919. Uh, the French were particularly keen on being very strict with the terms of the treaty. They wanted to keep Germany weak to prevent it rising again and forming a, a threat to, to France in the future. Well, in 1923, Germany failed to make a reparation payment. And as a consequence, the French and the Belgians sent troops to occupy the Ruhr and to take reparations in the form of, of coal and, and steel production from the Ruhr. Now, Germany already had a problem with inflation. It had large amounts of war debt. If you remember when uh, prosecuting the war, they hoped to exact reparations from the defeated countries at the end of the war. So they were left with war debts because they never got those reparations. So huge war debts from the war. In 1921, uh, reparations are announced, so that's 6.6 .6 billion pounds sterling. So they've already got a lot of inflationary pressure. So these two factors are leading already to inflation. Now, the German government orders passive resistance to the occupation in the Ruhr. In other words, it orders the workers of the Ruhr not to help the French troops. Now, this consequently creates a lot more unemployment. Not only do you have those unemployed workers in the Ruhr, you have all of the industries within Germany that depend on the raw materials of the Ruhr. So they've got factories, they need raw materials, they're not getting raw materials from the Ruhr, so they lay off workers. So consequently, you've got a high level of unemployment within Germany. So there's a couple of effects of this level of unemployment on the government and its budget. In the one hand, they have lost tax revenue because if you're unemployed, you're not working, you're not getting a salary, and you're not paying tax to the government. So the government has lost money in the form of tax revenue, and it's paying out more money in, the ter in unemployment payments to unemployed workers and striking workers in the Ruhr. So government's spending a lot more money than it's receiving, so consequently you get a budget deficit. The money the government's receiving in the form of taxation is far less than the amount of money it's spending. This is a big problem. How on earth can it deal with this? So the, uh, the, the idea is print more money. Print more money to pay the striking workers and to pay out unemployment benefit. Well, this, together with the existing inflationary factors, 
causes inflation to spiral out of control. There are far less goods within Germany because there's far less production. There's money floating around though, chasing those goods, and inflation spirals out of control into hyperinflation. Um, hyperinflation, I, I'm sure you, you've seen some of the images of people trying to pay for things with wheelbarrows of money, uh, money essentially becoming uh, worthless. People are, are paying for things like cinema tickets with lumps of coal or they're bartering. Let's have a look though at uh, some winners and losers during this period of hyperinflation. Well, winners were industrialists and landowners with debts because those debts essentially became nothing. You, you know, if you, bought, if you borrowed money or you'd bought a house and you were still paying it off, uh, or you'd, you know, you'd bought industrial machinery, uh, great, you basically, your debts uh, went from very large debts to being virtually nothing. Currency speculators also uh, made money out of this, people such as the industrialist Hugo Stinners. And these were mainly the wealthy, they came out quite well out of it. Permanent losers though uh, were savers, uh, you know, you've got savings, you hope to live on those, it becomes worthless, people with bank accounts, insurance policies, uh, pensions, people who'd lent the government money, they lost out a lot, so their savings, pensions, etc., became worthless. And these were principally in the middle class. Now, a lot of the middle class are already largely right-wing, uh, and this, again, fosters resentment long-term, really, towards the Weimar government. They're permanent losers in hyperinflation. Temporary losers, though, are people without debts or savings. They, they suffer in the short term. They don't really have any goods to barter, for example. Um, but in the long term, they're okay. Their wages do recover, and they didn't have any, many savings to begin with anyway. So you know, the working class are sort of temporary losers, but in the long term, they're all right in the hyperinflationary crisis. Let's have a look at some political unrest now. Um, in mid-1923, so we're looking really at 1923 here, uh, prices do start to outstrip wages. The, the trade unions are negotiating increases in wages, and again, that pushes up inflation even further. Uh, but in mid-1923, uh, the prices just outstrip wages, and even in the, in the working class there are strikes, there are hunger riots, there's looting. Germany is very unstable. Um, and again, fears here in the right wing are realised of a communist takeover when there's a, the Communist Party, with help from the, the, the Comintern in, in Russia, the Communist International, the Communists seize power in Saxony. Within the right wing, you're going to see later on that after they're put down, you can guess that the Free Corps put those down. Uh, within the right wing, uh, the French in the Ruhr creates a, a really nationalistic mood, uh, a huge resentment of the French and, and, um, and a movement of real nationalist feeling. Uh, the, both the middle and the upper class uh, are fearing a communist putsch, uh, a putsch which has actually occurred within Saxony. And in the context of this resentment happens, uh, oh, by the way, let's just talk briefly about Stresemann. Um, we'll talk more about him in class anyway. Stresemann. Uh, he's actually a fairly right-wing uh, politician, but he's a moderate. Um, he becomes Chancellor of a coalition group in 1923. He does a couple of things, really, which uh, help save Germany. Um, he ends passive resistance uh, in the Ruhr, uh, and he also uh, uses the Free Corps, dispatches the Free Corps, uh, the Free Corps EP, to put, brutally put down uh, the, um, the, the KPD revolt in Saxony. So. Let's move on now and look at the Beer Hall Putsch of 1923. Well, the extreme right are really annoyed, actually, at uh, Stresemann's um, capitulation, his so-called quitting, his giving up to the French. Uh, several influential figures now begin thinking about plotting a right-wing coup, a right-wing putsch, a takeover of the government. Figures such as the uh, Alfred Hugenberg, Hugo Stinners, von Siecht of the German and Ludendorff of the German army and what they plan is using Bavaria in the south of Germany and the right-wing politician is running Bavaria, Gustav von Kahr, he's running Bavaria they're planning probably what, a coup within Bavaria and then to use that as a springboard to march on Berlin and take over, a right-wing takeover of the Weimar Republic well, Gustav Stresemann, he's dealt uh, with the communist revolt in Saxony by brutally dispatching the Free Corps. He plays a different game with the, the right-wingers in Bavaria. He basically plays a clever waiting game. And von Kahr and von Siegt and Stiers, they're not sure what to do. They argue, they prevaricate, they delay. And the right-wing um, coup is just not taking place. Well... So somebody who's annoyed, who's at the fringes uh, of Bavarian politics and who has been let into these uh, coup 
uh, discussions is the young Adolf Hitler of the National Socialist Party. Um, he gets annoyed with the delays and basically bursts into a meeting uh, of right-wing uh, nationalists in Bavaria uh, with Gustav von Kahr, starts waving a pistol around, gets von Kahr and his uh, friends into a meeting room and, you know, demands waving a pistol in their face. <laughs> Uh, demands that they support uh, an immediate putsch and a march on Berlin. Well, unsurprisingly, with a pistol waving in their face, they agree. Uh, they, um, naively, though, Hitler lets von Kahr uh, and the leaders of the Bavarian uh, government leave the meeting hall. Uh, and basically, they, they call the police, they call the cops and alert them to Hitler's plans. Well, the following day, um, Hitler organises a march through Munich he, he naively again hoping that there's going to be a popular groundswell supporting his putsch, especially you know after the so-called capitulation, the giving up in the Ruhr. Um, however, the police uh, have been alerted by von Kahr. They remain loyal to von Kahr, and the putsch is a failure. I think 16 to 18 people are killed. You read different numbers. So about 14, 16 Nazis are killed, and and the putsch fails essentially due to internal divisions within the right wing you know, between the National Socialists, for example, and the right-wing conservatives like von Kahr and von Siegt and so on. So let's move on. So why did the Republic survive? The left lacked popular support. Um, you know, they'd, they'd attempted takeovers, but they lacked broad popular support within Germany for, a, you know, a communist uh, Soviet-style state. The right also lacked broad support within Germany, and also suffered from internal divisions, for example, between the National Socialist Party and other right-wing groups in Bavaria. They didn't use their resources together. Had they cooperated, had they, you know, von Siegt and Stinners and Hugenberg and Hitler cooperated at that stage, perhaps they may have been successful in a coup at that stage. But really, throughout Germany, there's a broad level of support, ranging from the enthusiastic to the reluctant, to the kind of wait-and-see uh, support for the Republic. The Social Democrats are, are, are a pretty significant force and there's a, a, a widespread feeling of you know, give democracy a chance in Germany. So I hope that was uh, useful for you. I hope you made some notes. Uh, bring your notes, bring your questions, come to the lesson prepared to discuss and debate.